Major von Trapp was fascinated with submarines, and he'd been transferred in 1908 to the Navy's newly formed submarine division, where he was given command of the Austrian U-6 in 1910, and he would remain its captain until 1913, when he was given the Austrian U-5 that would be his boat during the Great War. And the four submarines of that class launched in 1909 had been going on ten training cruises every month until they went into action in 1914. A U-boat was an undersea boat, and the first U-boats built in 1906 were prototypes until they started getting good in 1910 when seven U-boats were built. And these were designed to operate at a depth of 160 feet, but could dive down to 300 feet in a pinch. The design improved further in 1911, and another six U-boats were put to sea after a six-month pause for retooling. And only two experimental boats were launched in January and March of 1911, and that brought on the improved version at the end of the summer in 1911 with four U-boats that could now do some real damage. The following spring, the U-17 and U-18 came out in April of 1912 and would remain the only one of their kind, and submarine building would resume in 1913 with the launching of 12 new U-boats, one every month, and that would continue into the year 1914 until the beginning of the Great War, when submarine production greatly increased. When the war started, the German Navy had 48 submarines of various kinds, either working or under construction, and that would increase to 375 undersea boats until the Great War was over. Some of the submarines were built at Krupp's Germania shipyard at Kiel, where 84 of the U-boats were produced during the Great War, and Kiel was 60 miles away from the North Sea through the Kiel Canal that cut through the base of the Danish peninsula. The Lusitania was sunk by the U-20 in May of 1915, just south of Ireland on the same route that the Titanic had sailed out of Southampton and the British had been blockading Germany when the Lusitania was sunk, but the U-boats could still get through, and the gun mounts on the Lusitania had been installed, but she'd not yet gotten her guns. Blockading Germany meant that all food imports were being seized by the British as contraband, and they had mined the Danish Straits as well as the approaches to the Kaiser Kiel Canal, and the, Lus the Lusitania sank in 20 minutes after a second internal explosion fired off, killing 1,200 people. An inventory of the munitions on board has yet to be completed due to the danger of the task, and the Germans claim that the identity of the Lusitania had been disguised and that she'd been flying no flags, and the sinking was supposed to bring America into the war because there were 130 Americans among those who died. While von Trapp had been learning about submarines in the lovely port of Trieste, construction on the Titanic began in April of 1909, and the hull plates of the Titanic were rolled steel that varied from one to one and a half inches thick and were held together with over three million iron and steel rivets. The Titanic was launched on the 31st of May in 1911, but she was not christened with a bottle of champagne or any other alcohol in accordance with White Star Line policy, and an entire year after that went into fitting her out for her maiden voyage on the 10th of April in 1912 and the Titanic bragged an underwater draft of 35 feet, and her hull plates were subject to becoming brittle in the cold. The early U-boats had a range of 4,000 miles, and that meant 2,000 miles was their point of no return, and the Titanic was sunk 2,000 miles away from the coast of Ireland, from where any U-boat could have refueled with the help of the friendly Irish after it had sailed from the Germans' base at Heligoland. The Germans knew that they could not outrun the Titanic, because the submarine could only manage 12 miles per hour submerged and 16 on the surface, while the Titanic was boasting 28 miles per hour full out. And the Germans also knew 
that the Titanic had wireless, so if they were to make any kind of maritime statement, it would have to be done at night, under cover of darkness, and if a U-boat rammed the side of the Titanic, it could feel like an iceberg until clandestine agents delivered the news to the Royal Navy that it had indeed been a submarine. Tess had shown that the U-boat would not be harmed in so doing as hitting their dock back home was a frequent occurrence, and that was what had given them the idea in the first place. The British would report that it must have been an iceberg because the English-speaking world would be terrified to learn that Germany had U-boats that could travel that far, a mere 700 miles off the shores of North America, and that Germans had only wanted to leave a scrape on the side of the Titanic to prove that a U-boat had been there, but the cold steel on cold steel did much more damage than had been anticipated. Had the purpose been to sink her, the U-boat could have easily torpedoed the ship, and it would be reported by survivors that the Titanic's captain had seen a single white light from a distance that had probably been the U-boat surfacing to see if the Titanic had noticed their presence. The Titanic weighed 52,000 tons, and the U-boat weighed only 500 tons, and when the U-boat surfaced from a safe distance, they had seen the Titanic stopped in the water, firing white rockets, and when the Titanic's captain watched the light moving away, he'd instructed the men lowering the lifeboats to row towards that light. The Germans, who had surfaced half an hour after ramming into the ship, thought the white lights were a celebratory gesture meant to reassure any passengers who might have heard the noise of contact, which should have been incredibly loud inside the U-boat. And the Germans had seen that the rockets being fired from the Titanic were white instead of red, and red rockets at sea would have meant distress or an emergency and so they had turned towards home because they were burning precious gasoline. The SMU-17 was launched the day after the sinking of the Titanic, and this new submarine had an improved range of 7,700 miles. And with the U-17, Germany had taken a great leap forward from the previous 16 U-boats. Its brother, the U-18, was launched on the 25th of April in 1912, and the next German submarines would have a range of 12,000 miles, beginning with the SMU-19, launched that October. And after the U-17 and 18, no U-boat would be completed for the next six months. After the three submarines of the U-13 class that were operating in 1912 had demonstrated the ability to sail that far into the ocean, they had not so much proved the capability of the machine as they had shown the stamina of the men, and all of the U-boats after the sinking of the Titanic would be built with extended range capabilities previously thought to be beyond human endurance. The British had planned to put some really big guns on board the Titanic because they knew the Great War was coming, so room had been left on Titanic's decks for shore battery guns instead of putting in lifeboats. And while the Titanic's future as a warship was not openly discussed, the British military had paid for much of its construction and had even designed Titanic's engines. Somewhere in the deep, cold, dark North Atlantic, the submariners, submariners, had been laying in wait for the Titanic, and after making contact with its hull, they surfaced to see the huge ship stopped dead in the water, and they could verify that the Titanic had indeed noticed their signature and that the mission had been accomplished. The terrific scraping noise of their boat grinding along the side of the ship would be enough to prove their point without any loss of life, and they had readily been able to determine the exact path of the ship in those days before zigzagging would become the rule. Their calculations made by the stars told them precisely where the ship would be coming along, and the mark on the ship would prove their claim rather than the British thinking that perhaps the Titanic had merely hit some flotsam or maybe even a dead whale. As the Germans were laying in wait for her, 
They would have been able to see her lights from a long way off, and the U-boat had only one chance to leave that mark on the Titanic, because the ocean liner was running twice as fast as the submarine could possibly manage, and so it had indeed been an impressive feat that should have given Britain pause in their warmongering against the fatherland. Rather than simply bumping the ship a single time, the U-boat had been prepared to thrust her engines fully forward at the first sign of contact, rather than merely bouncing off once, and after blowing their ballast and submerging beneath the wake of the Titanic, the U-boat had continued beneath the surface until they were out of range of Titanic searchlights even though the British would say there had been no searchlights on board, which would explain why they couldn't search for the iceberg on which to unload passengers. There had been some confusion aboard the Titanic about whether they'd hit an iceberg or a U-boat because some on deck claimed to have seen a submarine right before they hit, but these witnesses had been drinking a great deal and had been reading too many newspapers. However, the captain probably thought it was a U-boat because he'd immediately ordered full speed ahead to get away from the submarine, and when damage reports came back that the Titanic's increased speed was flooding her watertight compartments, the captain had ordered the engines to a neutral stop, at which point an iceberg was nowhere to be seen, onto which they could have offloaded the passengers once it was determined that the ship was doomed. Newspapers would report that ice had spilled onto the deck from being scraped off an iceberg because they didn't want to alarm the public about any German U-boats that could make a long, narrow, sharp gash in ships well below the water line. And Captain Lord on board the California thought the Titanic was just shooting off fireworks in celebration because somebody had loaded the wrong color rockets on the Titanic that were supposed to be red instead of white. Some said that the Titanic's captain had ordered a turn to port to get closer to the single bright light he'd seen on the horizon that the radio men purported to have been the California, and they said that the captain had tried to get closer to it when he ordered the turn to port, but that the light had been moving away from them. The captain wanted to signal to it with, with, with lights instead of relying on the Marconi, so he had started up Titanic's engines again to generate enough electricity to power the larger lights, since without her engines running, there were only two 30-kilowatt generators for emergency use, and he remained stationary because moving through the sea had caused the ship to take on water faster. Of the 2,224 people on board, give or take, 710 would be saved, and 212 of them were crewmen needed to row the lifeboats that were carrying 500 passengers away from the sinking ship, lest they be sucked into the vortex when it went under. The next morning, the people in the lifeboats were rescued by the Carpathia, a ship named after a mountain range outside Vienna that was as far from the bottom of the ocean as possible on planet Earth. Numerous eyewitness accounts described the ship splitting in two before it sank, and the day would come when a camera could be sent down to take photographs of the wreckage of the Titanic that was over 12,000 feet deep with water pressure over 6,000 pounds per square inch, and the French sent down ultrasound radar to look beneath the mud into which the ship had settled on the sea floor. The radar documented that there had been no sharp gash, such as the men seeing the damage firsthand described, but instead the ship had a series of four long, thin openings, smaller than the size of a human hand, a buckling along the line of the hull plates where they'd been forced open and the seawater was able to come through. Less than a half dozen men working in the boiler rooms had seen the actual damage before the fatal crack was completely submerged underwater, and the French radar showed the buckling had started at the front of the ship, 24 feet above the keel, or 11 feet below the water line, and the cracking increased in length as it skipped four times along the front third of the ship. The first crack 
twelve feet long, the second sixteen feet, the third thirty-three feet, and the final gap forty-five feet in length, extending another two feet aft of boiler room number six, where the men had been working to stoke the fires that ran Titanic's engines. Each scar was divided by an increasing interval from twenty-four feet to thirty feet to thirty-nine feet between them, and they dropped down in a decreasing sequence from twenty-four feet above the keel near the bow to ten feet above the keel at boiler room number six, as though the iceberg had been given the order to dive. One of Titanic's crew named George Simons testified that he'd thought the Titanic had lost her anchor with its chain because it sounded as though the chain was dragging along underneath the ship and the scraping had gone on for ten long seconds and Simons was a, an able seaman who had already made the Atlantic crossing over five dozen times. Simons also testified that after getting into the lifeboats, He'd seen the same single white light that was five to ten miles away, and he and the others had taken it for a fishing vessel, and they had laid into the oars, rowing towards the light, but Simon said it had been moving away from them and then just disappeared. The witnesses who gave testimony during the subsequent investigation into the disaster were also split down the middle over whether Titanic's engines had been ordered to stop before or after hitting the iceberg, and the testimony also varied between those who had seen an iceberg and those who had not, and they differed between those who had seen block ice scraped onto the deck and those who had seen none, and when encouraged to give details about the iceberg, all testimony appeared coordinated and rehearsed, except for one man who said that it looked like the rock of Gibraltar, and another two who said it was as big as two of the Senate room hearing tables put together. The British and the Americans conducted separate inquiries, and the British hearings lasted for thirty-six days while the Americans took half that long, having gotten to the witnesses first while the survivors were in New York and their memories were fresh. The bulk of the questioning in Britain concerned why some partially full lifeboats had not gone back to save the people who were screaming in the twenty-eight degree water, and the British also wanted to know whether or not the lifeboat rowers had taken bribes from the rich people they had rescued. In the end, it was determined that the wealthy passengers had merely donated charity to the sailors who had lost their jobs and possessions when the Titanic went down, and the British conclusion to the matter was that the Titanic had hit an iceberg that had split the ship open for 300 feet from the front of the bow all the way to boiler room number six, even though some testimony described that there had been places towards the bow where the side of the ship had remained intact and water had not been coming in. No testimony was taken about any damage forward of Boiler Room 6, because within a half hour there had been eight feet of water in that section, and the ship was already listing as the front holds were being filled. Several firemen testified that they saw water pouring in from a crack on the starboard side two feet above the floor in boiler room number six, and from these eyewitnesses working in that section, the British Commission determined that the plates had been gashed open by the iceberg ten feet above the bottom of the ship and twenty-five feet below the water line, which would have been at periscope death. While the first hit at the bow was only eleven feet below the water line, as determined by the French radar, and the consensus among every witness was that the sea had been as smooth as glass that night. The saddest part of the Titanic investigations was the testimony of the two young men who'd been in the crow's nest serving as lookouts that night, and both of them were incapable of describing the iceberg no matter how hard they were pressed, and their responses were painfully dedicated to an offering up of a suitable description of the iceberg that would satisfy the authorities. 
Hitler would depend heavily on U-boats in his war against the designers of the Versailles Treaty, and 60% of his submarines would be lost in action, killing three-quarters of Germany's 40,000 submariners. And no nobody could have imagined that Hitler's war would have gone on as long as it did.